Um, second Star to the Right by Judith and Garfield Reeves Stevens. She was lost, surrounded by the precariously stacked cast off debris of an antique alien city. Beneath unfamiliar stars and a single bloated moon, her feet swelling from the stored daytime heat of the sand and gravel she had crossed, from the endless walking, from the ridiculously contorted shoes Julian had insisted she wear. It was enough to make a person say, end program, and go back to her quarters in. No, as Redax said out loud. She was many things. Many to the power of nine. she thought <laughs> but she wasn't a quitter well to buy in was a bit of a quitter when it comes to dealing with Rafi and Audrid always believed she could have done more to save Havain and Torius well okay as Re reluctantly admitted to herself Torius wouldn't have gotten lost in the first place. But there was that time when, ugh, she said to the break the resent, the re relentlessly unpredictable connective thread of interaction and reflection that stitched together all the life she had lived. That at least part of her had lived. I'm doing it again. She sighed, breathing in the night's cool desert air shivering as she hugged her sleeveless arms to her chest. The tiny discs of reflective plastic sewn to the fabric of the long midnight blue gown she wore, almost wore, scratched the flesh off of her arms. Off her arms. <laughs> across her back, across her exposed back, there was only a chill on far too much bare skin. On yeah, okay. One more time, she wondered why she kept letting Julian talk her into these bizarre historical costumes and adventures from Earth's past. She took her head determin she shook her head determinedly, as if that's all it would take to clear more than three centuries worth of cobwebs. If an ad pops up, spam chat and I'll pause reading. Just it hit me. I should make sure to say that. I'll make commands for that too. Um, okay. She addressed herself firmly. She looked at a towering construction of colored glass tubes and wire and metal to her side. In the soft light of the full moon, she could see it formed a caricature of humanoid male with a vacant grin and narrow mustache wearing a circular black hat with a dislike brim. One hand held up an eternal wave of greeting or a warning to go no further. I saw you from the front gate, she said to the impressive giant, and there you were on my left. As we peered into the dark labyrinth of the other twisted tangles of glass and metal, thin rods and shafts jambled and interlocked in what Judsia might recognize as enormous metal crystals grown at random. So the gate should be somewhere in that direction on the right. She gazed above the rag black silhouettes and formed a fractile horizon of debris in the direction, but the the desert air was so clear she could detect no decent distant glow of the blazing lights of the city she sought. The stars were as straight and bright was as dark and bright in every direction. The space between them as impenetrably black, whether she was wherever she was wherever she had to go her surroundings were offering no clue as to what her direction should be i have to just ezra faltered having utterly failed convincing herself of her logic 
go straight down there and ugh. Why do I even pretend to know what I'm doing? She kicked vi vi viciously at the gravel beneath her, sending up a pale cloud of dust in the moonlight. At the same time, thrillingly wedging a small, sharp stone under her cramped and crushed together toes. Ugh, she said again as she hopped awkwardly on one foot, trying to twist off open-toed shoe to the free, the free the stone. But hopping on gravel and high-heeled shoes was next to impossible. And when you're confounded by the long, tight gown she wore, not even all of Emony's gymnastic skills could come to Ezra's rescue. With a straggled cry of they strangled cry of frustration, Esri toppled backwards to brace herself for the impact of the sharp gravel along her bare back. Then gasped as in surprise of a pair of strong hands caught her and gallantly restored her to her feet. Julian, she said as she spun around to her face, her rescuer, arms already reaching out to embrace him. But the blinding smile that greeted her didn't belong to the chief medical officer of Deep Space Nine. Sorry to disappoint you, doll. It was Vic Fontaine. God damn it, it was fucking Vic. <laughs> A holographic simulation of Contour Central Las Vegas nightclub singer from Earth. See a 1962 ACE. He gave her a wink. I had forgot that Vic is like instantly in this. <laughs> I have to. All right. As he dropped her arms, Vic smiled as if he could sense the change in her mood. I was going to ask. What a broad like you is doing in a dump like this, Vic said. But I think I get the picture. The boyfriend's a big no-show, am I right or am I right? Okay, so I was going to ask, what a broad Lex you do in a dump like this, Vic said. But I think I got the picture. I get the picture. The boyfriend's a big no-show, am I right or am I right? Ezra shifted uncomfortably on the gravel, one foot still in bondage to its shoe, the other resorting uncomfortably on the rough stones. Actually, Julian doesn't know I came up here. Vic shot her a sideways look. What? You two lovebirds have a spat? Esri shook her head, almost lost her balance again. No, we had a date down on the strip. She waved her hand around. Vaguely trying to indicate the direction of Las Vegas, three st simulated kilometers some direction or another from here, but gave up. She had no idea where the city was anymore. But he got called into emergency surgery. Son of a gun, Vic said. Haven't been a lot of that since the big one, Esri nodded. The station had been quiet in the past few weeks since the Dominion War had finally ended. Life had been almost normal, or at least it appeared to be when filtered through Jadzia's memories. Ezra herself had been on the station for just less than a year and only knew it in the wartime state of operations and in the aftermath of the war. But even Ezra knew that the end of the war hadn't brought total peace to the station. I don't know how to say this. Connell? Connell? C-O-L-O-N-E-L. -E I don't know what that is. Is that a, well, it's Kira. Kira Norris. Uh, Kira was still brooding over Odo's departure and was stubbornly refusing most of Esri's offers to provide consoling. Instead, as the new commander of the station, she seemed to be supplementing all of her frustration, frustrated emotions into convoluted plans to catch Quark red-handed at something, anything illegal or even questionable. But at least that attention had given Cork a new purpose in life, except for those two when the Ferengi bar kept, when the Ferengi barkeep had fled into holding on Bajor after some bio acceleration 
consolation. He had peddled. God damn it. Sorry, guys. He had peddled as succeeded in growing hair on every part of Morn's body except the prune faced alien's head. Cork had been the station's sole source of excitement. There'd be more excitement to come soon, though, as we knew. What with Cassidy Yates expecting Captain Sisko's baby and half the religious leaders of Bajor debating the significance of the birth in the light of the mysterious rash of the new visions being experienced by those who used, used the orbs. On top of that, the Kardashian... Kardashian... I keep saying it wrong. Kardashian reconstruction effort was finally hitting stride, and even Bajor was contributing supplies and personal to restore that battered work, making DS9 loading docks work at full capacity, 26 hours a day, and you're shivering, Vic said. As we came out of her revere, as the hologram wrapped his black sports jacket around her bare shoulders. I did it again, she said crossingly. You gotta give me more than that to go on, doll. Rambling, as we said, it's, I think, one thought, and that makes me think of another, and it's not as if I only have one lifetime of memories to remember. I've got eight, so everything, I think, reminds me of something else, and the next thing I know, as we pause, distracted by a sudden recollection of how Curzon had once had a similar conversation with Ben Sisko at Utopia Planetaria, it was late in the night after Sisko's shift was over. Curzon had added healthily drops of Sarno brandy to the Rakatijo. I hate Rakatijo. I definitely said that wrong. Um, Ezra said to Vic's bafflement. But Jadzia had enjoyed the beverage, which made Ezra remember one night when Jadzia and Sisko had been talking late at Corks after Sisko's shift was over. Ugh! Don't tell me, Vic said kindly. Rambling? Especially when I'm upset. Such as when a certain young doctor gets called off for an emergency surgery on a Saturday night? Esri studied the hologram, suddenly confused. It's not Saturday, is it? Oh my god, I can't wait to see your jester hat. Holy shit, that's going to be amazing. I don't know why I missed that and saw that. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Esri studied the hologram, suddenly confused. It's not Saturday, is it? Vic shrugged with a patient grin. Hey, doll, it's not Saturday. This isn't Las Vegas, and I'm sure not, I'm sure it's not 1962. There's a hollow sweet wall 10 feet in front of you, but why spoil a booty fall evening with cold hard facts? He offered his arm. Come on, you look like you need to take a load off. Esri had no idea what the hologram meant by that, but she took his arm and, using her free hand to keep his jacket tightly closed around her throat. I don't think I can watch walk much further on the gravel, she warned him. Then why don't you walk over here, Vic said. Esri looked where he was pointing and saw an expression of grass edging the gravel right beside her. She set her shoeless feet upon it. It was soft, springingly, and impossible to miss. But somehow she had impossible, she thought. Unless, did you do that? As we asked. Vic guided her toward what appeared to be a large shoe. Maybe two meters tall to the heel. In the moonlight, it had a metallic, silvery shimmer. Do what? The grass. Aren't all the simulation parameters set to a factory or something? Hey, doll, do I look like a parameter? Esri didn't believe it, but she felt embarrassed because she might just have insulted a hologram. Somewhere deep within her, Tobian had memories, earliest versions of what would become hollow sweet technology. The bulky encounter suits, the crude sensory helmets, the extendingly clumsy feedback gloves. Four lifetimes later, Jordan had fought Joran had fought a disturbingly new application for the emergency technology. Is that really sitting there not charging? 
Hang on, sorry. Okay. Four lifetimes later, Joran ha Jor Joran had fought a disturbingly new application for emergency emergency emerging technology. But for all of the memories of the holographic environment shared by Ezri's predecessors, such recollection carried with a clear-cut knowledge that such artificially constructed environments were unreal, but not to Ezri. She had grown up with the hollow environments. As a child back on Sephora 7, she had a personal hollow playroom that had served as a welcome escape for her mother, from her mother for both her and her younger brother, Norva. In fact, one of the first encounters with Earth had been in her favorite program, an extremely realistic simulation of an African vet complete with wildlife. Apparently, it was a classic. The early experience with Holotech had made it easy for Ezra to adapt to Starfleet Academy's extensive use of even more sophisticated simulations for training its young cadets. And now, since she had joined with the Dax Symbia, and her mind was constantly flooded with memories of all the Dax previous hosts, object objective had reason for her not to think of holograms as more or any real than thousands of individuals who populated her shared memories. In fact, since Vic Fontaine was some of the quirk of programming, a hologram who knew he was a hologram, Ezra felt she had even less reason to think of him as anything other than a real individual. I'm sorry, Ezra said. I don't mean to, you know, no offense, taken doll. Vic stopped, then looked around the clearing in the midst of the graveyard as if it had arrived at a long sought destination. This looks like the place. What place? The place the rest of the barking dogs of yours. Again, Vic pointed, and it was as if he had gotten a cue to some unseen stage manager back at the nightclub. A moment later, the giant shoe blazed with lights, studded as it was dozens of incandescent glass globes. Esri blinked at the sudden sight of the flooded, the clearing, wondering how Vic had known the shoe would light up just then, as if he had somehow been responsible for what it had done. Either way, now she could see was surrounded not by bulky mechanicary and sculptures, but by signs. She was, she saw individual letters. There was a full two meter hide, giant bottles poisoned, posed, posed, over equally mammoth glasses. What looked to be a chorus of line dancing Dabo girls frozen in mid kick. Some signs were outlined by glass globes, others by glass tubes. For a moment, Ezra, Ezria would, Ezri wondered if the map she had consulted was in air. This might not be a junkyard after all. It could be some kind of art museum. What is this place? Yes, Co. Vic said with a dramatic flourish of his hand. The young electric sign company that's been making all the signs on the strip since the whole big bowl, big ball of wax got started. Ezri still didn't understand. But these look broken. Is it a repair factory? Repair facility? Some things can't be fixed, sweetheart. As you watched as Vic regarded the derelict signs with holographic sadness. The silver slipper, the golden nugget, Caesars, all kaput, all finito. That's Las Vegas for ya, a real neverland. Home to the lost boys, lost dreams, here today, gone tomorrow. Wait a minute, what's a sign from Caesars doing here? Vic turned to her, her eyes wide with a delighted surprise. What kind of question is that? Well, this is Las Vegas, 1962, right? Don't stop now, you're on a roll. Esri paused, decided Vic's colloquialism was some sort of food allusion, and ignored it. 
but the gaming establishment known as Caesar's Palace was still in operation as of 2053. Ah. But the two months following the outbreak... Wait, I lost my spot. I'm sorry. Um, for two months following the outbreak of Earth's World War III, Caesar's was the operational command center for Canals Amber's regimental volunteers. It was the site of the final battle of, Vic said it was her, the Sage of Las Vegas. He cooked his head at her, curious. How's a little girl like you know so much about things like that? Esri shut, rugged. Well, that's why I decided to come here tonight. I was checking out this location for Julian, in case he wanted to try out a new historical last stand. He got a thing for lost causes. Then you've come to the right place. No, no, if this is 1962, or a reasonable fascism, therefore, Vic said, then how can you know what's going to happen after World War III almost? She hesitated as she did the math. After lifetimers of thinking in terms of clear and straightforward star, star dates, Earth years were hopelessly perplexing in comparison. 91 years later, Vic said, Hopefully, exactly, as we said. Isn't that like breaking the rules? Vic looked up at the stars, all the brightest ones now hidden by the glare from the blazing silver shoe. He tugged on his shirt collar, loosening his thin black tie. Depends on who makes the rules, wouldn't you say? Well, as we began uncertainly. Then what would the whole pro... Then that would be whoever programmed you in the first place, right? My pal Felix, great guy, but sometimes he ha he's been known to borrow a bit of code from this place and that. So out here at the edge of the program, sometimes things get a bit muddled. Sort of like me, you know? Vic looked up at the stars as if, washing, as if wishing he could reach to them. Sure, I'm strictly 1962, but I gotta tell you, I know everything there is to know about the station you all say you come from, and that's century. Vic looked back at Esri and tapped a finger against her nose. Just between you and me and the man in the moon, I don't think Felix has a good grasp of the importance of purging memory buffers. Not that I'm complaining, mind you. You'd be surprised what happens when programmer, programming mixes it up up here. You get lots of stuff. Unexpected interacting, interactions. Not that a mutt like me has any idea what I'm talking about. Ezra gazed, gla gazed, glazed. <laughs> Ezra gazed thoughtfully at Vic's smoothly handsome face framed in silver hair. He was in Egema among holograms. That much everyone on DS9 could agree on. He knew he was a hologram. He had the capability of entertaining other Hollister simulations, and he seems to have some kind of ongoing existence, even when the Hollis Suites is Quirk's bar were offline. Jake Sisko has sometimes wondered if Vic might be a captive alien personality and somehow downloaded into the Hollow Suites memory circuits. Chief O'Brien, when overly forfeited by Bloodwine, had once forwarded the theory that Vic represented the next step in evolution of machine intelligence, like the eerie lifelike emergency medical hologram that they were becoming more common through Starfleet. Vic, may I ask you a question? Vic gave her a playful smile, as if he could read her mind as easily as a betazoid and knowing what was coming. Shoot, dollface. What is it like being a hologram? Vic laughed. Answer me this first. What's it like being a trill? I think you mean a joined trill. You say tomato. Again with the food, as we thought. But she gave Vic's question a serious consideration. Not because of anything in Jadzia or Audrid's or even Joran's past. Because of her own. Esri's Starfleet training as a counselor. What is it like being joined? She repeated. In a word. Confused. Vic gestured with open hands held to the heavens. What is it like being a hologram? 
I couldn't have said it better myself. Confused with a capital con. Esri frowned. Not willing to accept the answer for Ferengi second. What does a hologram have to be confused about? Vic stared at her, open mouth, and shook his head once, exactly as Ezra had seen some Las Vegas comedian do on earlier date she'd had with Julian. Jimmy the Ratty, or something like that. You think being confused is something that can only happen to your kind of people, Vic said? He tapped both hands to his chest beneath his loosened tie and opened his collar. I'm a 20th century hologram in a 24th century world. Sometimes I have to ask myself, am I the only real McCoy on the face of the earth? And all the people are mathematical constructs being generated by some big number crunching hunk of transitors and vacuum tubes out in the great beyond. Don't get me wrong, sweetheart. I love my life, but still... Sometimes I wonder where, where it is I'm going, and worse yet, where I was before I was here. Ezri caught herself replying with more than one touch of the Jadzia, the scientist. Therefore, questions are merely a common function of any self-aware intelligence attempting to build patterns from the past in order to anticipate the future. She paused, grimacing at how cold she had sounded. Wait, what... I meant to say is how confusing can life be for you if you've been programmed to mesh perfectly with your environment? I mean, you know, where all the greasy parts are. You know where the lights will go on. It's, it's a perfect match. I think I need to drink water. Perfect, Vic raised his eyebrows skeptically. It doesn't work that way, dollface. From my side of the street, I'm looking at you saying, how confusing can it be for her? She can go anywhere in the whole wide universe, see anything, be anyone for real. Sudden fatigue swept over Esri. She looked around, and I lost my spot. Uh, she looked around for some place to sit. It doesn't work that way for me either. Maybe he really can read my mind, Esri thought. As she watched Vic drag a large metal box out from behind the glowing silver slipper, the grimy container looked as if it had once had electronical connections back in the day before transitors. Vic brushed off the top surface of the box, seconding pumps of the holograph, dust in the air. Park it here, doll, he said. Esri took that as an invitation to sit down and did, wenching as the sudden chill of the metal made itself known through the fabric of her gown. Vic swung foot on the corner of the box, rested an elbow against his knee. So you're not convincing me. About what? About you not having it better than me. As we tried to find a blunter way to put it, I didn't choose my life. Join the club, sweet cakes. But, but... Esri sputtered. Take it easy, doll. It sounds like you're having trouble getting started. Are the ads running right now, or did they just run? I'm going to hit this bowl in case they're running. <laughs> All right. All right. Perfect. Victor raised his eyebrows skeptically. It doesn't work that way, dollface. But from my side of the street, I'm looking at you saying, how confusing can it be for her? She can go anywhere in the world, in the whole wide universe, see anything, be anyone for real. Sudden fatigue slipped over Esri. She looked around for some place to sit. It doesn't work that way for me either. Maybe he can really read my mind as we thought as she watched Vic drag a long, drag a large metal box out from besides the glowing silver slipper. The grimy container looks as if it had once held electrical connections back in the day before transitors. Vic brushed off the top of the surface 
of the box, sending puffs of holographic dust in the air. Park it here, doll, he said. Esri took that as an invitation to sit and did when she knows the sudden chills from the metal made itself through the fabric of her gown. Vic swung foot up on the corner of the box, rested an elbow against the knee. So you're not convincing me. About what? About having it better than me. Esri tried to find a blunter way to put it. I didn't choose my life. Join the club, sweet cakes. But, but, Esri sputted. Take it easy, doll. Sounds like you're having trouble getting started. I heard you sing, Vic. You're good. Vic nodded thoughtfully. But not as good as Frank. But I won't give you an argument on that one. Which makes me think you enjoy what you do. This time, Vic's smile transformed his face. Oh, yeah. To be up at the mic, belting out pure gold, holding that audience in the palm of my hand to Ezria, to Ezri, Vic seemed to be staring at the same place sometime other than young electric sign company junkyard what can i tell you like the man said baby it's witchcraft exactly so at the end of the day no matter how you get here is there anything else you can imagine that would be more fulfilling than being a nightclub singer in the 1962 las vegas vic smiled at her clenched his chest just above his holographic heart and said you got me then he took it a more serious expression, which makes me think there's something else somewhere else you'd rather be. As we looked off at the surrounding signs, none of them fulfilling their functions anymore, no longer pointing the way to anywhere. She couldn't believe she was having this conversation with anyone, let alone a hologram. But then maybe the fact that Vic was a hologram was exactly why she could have this conversation with him. That's the problem, as we said. I can't answer that. I, I never got a chance to find out what I wanted. Not on my own. Not before I was joined. As we could see that Vic, whatever algorithm, algorithms fueled his awareness and his personality, appeared to sense the sudden serious mood that had enveloped her, drawing her into her own personal wormhole of despair. The hologram sat down beside her. The metal box creaked a bit under his illusionary weight. When he spoke, her voice was softer and more deliberate. I gotta tell you, I'm not up on all your fancy 24th century Flash Gordon Buck Rogers atomic ray rocket ships. You name it. Ezri stared at him blankly, having no idea what he was saying, but trusting he'd mention something familiar eventually but the one thing i do know vic said kindly is that this being joined miguel yet is not something that sneaks up on you is it i remember jensia talking about it once training for years selection committees only one out of a thousand qualifiers and even then they don't guarantee you a place at the table isn't that how it really goes, dollface? Ezra rubbed her eyes, wondering why she didn't call it a night. She could go back to her quarters or to Julian's, have some tea, fall asleep. When she wakes up, Julian would be there besides her to take all of her questions from her. But that would be quitting, too, she thought. You're half right, Vic, she said quietly. She was dimly aware of tears building up in her eyes, though she had no idea why. That's how it goes for every trill, except me. She made an effort to smile up at him. The hologram's silver hair was almost luminous in the bright lights of the slipper, as if his head was surrounded by a glowing nimbus of radiance. The image seemed to invoke some faint echo of recognition in her, something or someone or even a symbol from one of the other lives her symbiont had led, but she couldn't bring up anything more concrete. For an unsettling moment, it was it almost felt to Esri as if Dax part of her were gone or asleep, or somehow standing back from what she was doing now, as if this moment belonged to only her, could belong only to her. I don't get it, Vic said. What makes you so different? 
Such a simple question, as Ezri thought, with such a simple answer. But it still kept her up at night, staring into endless darknesses of the ceiling. Whether Julian was besides her or not, she realized then that there was no holding back. She had gone this far with no hologram. No, with Vic that she might as well see it through to the end. I never wanted to be joined, she told him hauntingly, the very words a scavenge against everything her world and her people hold dear. Vic nodded slowly, knowingly. Right now I remember when Jazia bought it, the symbiont headed home. Something goes wrong. It has to be joined or it's lights out forever. And you were the only troll on the ship. Esri opened her mouth to give her her rehearsed answer. The only one had been drilled into her by Starfleet and the Symbius Commission and by Dax and all the previous hosts now sharing her consciousness. But the words wouldn't come. Not here, not now. I wish, I wish it had been that simple, she said, her voice almost a whisper. She saw Vic study her, intrigued, and his expression made Esri smile. Isn't that what they were here having this discussion? Artificial joining? and joined Trill, both wrestling with their respective confusion? You mean, Vic said, that's not how it happened? No, Ezri said, that's exactly how it happened. But that's not all that happened. For long moments, Hologram and Trill held each other's gaze. Then Vic reached into his back pocket, pulled out a flat silver flask, twisted open its stopper. I've got a crazy feeling we're going to be here a while, he said. He held out the flask to Esri. Esri took it. She took it, smelled, it smelled some kind of earth brandy she couldn't identify. Took a swallow, felt it burn down so far down her throat, Dax shivered in her abdomen pocket. Bada bing, Vic said, as if he had felt the symbiote move himself. Then he took a swallow of his own and moved closer to Esri, so they were side by side. He sealed the flask put it behind them, and then slipped an arm around her as if to make sure his jacket was as snug as it could be. Esri didn't protest, didn't feel the least awkward and enjoyed. In fact, the feeling of inner warmth from the brandy and the security of Vic's arms around her. She leaned her head against his shoulder, looking up at the few stars bright enough to outshine the silver slipper alien stars that reminded her how lost she was. So what's your story? Vic asked. Esri laughed, feeling strangely better than she had in for months. Stories. That's more like it. Vic gave her a squeeze. Protective, nothing more, but just enough. Not their stories, doll. Your story. My story, Esri said. My story? That's the first word sounded odd. Because the way she said it, she wasn't talking about Esri Dax. She was talking about Esri Tegan, the person she used to be before she became the person she was. Where, damn, these pronouns she shot, she thought. We've got all night, Vic said soothingly. As long as you need, as long as you want. Esri snuggled in closer to Vic's broad shoulders letting her mind drift back and almost 18 months earlier to the one of her first Starfleet's assignments and her first glimpse of Deep Space Nine. I was on a starship, Esri said. Imagine that, Vic told her. A starship named Destiny. And as easy as that, the past came to life and in the main shutter bay of Starship Des Destiny. Ensign Esri Teagan pulled her long dark hair from her eyes, peered through the slightly fogged viewpoint of the medical transport pod. Yee, hi, sci-fi wasabi! Inside, bathed its bowels of... Let me finish this paragraph. In... What? Inside, bathed its billows of inert nitrogen and the purple mist of trill ocean water. The gaslighting brown sluggish shape of a symbiont. The life form from was driving force between Trill civilization, the shining idea for which all Trill children were raised to aspire to serve 
pul pulsated slowly. Um, Esri grinned at Brenner, her delight at teasing him multiplying as she saw his cheeks flush until they were almost as dark as the intricate curl cues of trill spots. curly cues. I didn't realize that was an actual word. Uh, and she... I'm laughing at myself now, sorry. <laughs> Her delight at teasing him, multiplying as she saw his cheeks flush until they were almost as dark as the in intricate curly cues of trill spots that ran up both sides of his high forehead. He was so serious, it was obvious he needed her to remind him that life held other possibilities than a constant devotion to duty. Last night, she considered she had done an especially good job at diverting his mind from his work. His cheeks had been flushed too then, and as if Brino also remembered how they had been pressed their evening, how they had passed their evening, he now allowed his typically intent expression to soften with a self-conscious smile. It didn't last, though. Suddenly, he reacted to something he saw from the corner of his eye, and a smile vanished as he snapped to the attention like a first-year cadet. As we turned to see what Brenner saw, and instinctingly strapped up from the transport pod, and the two security officers who flanked the beyond the pod, the Destiny's chief medical officer, Dr. Topeak, stepped down, stepped down from the TS-9 runabout, holding her medical tricorder before her like a protective sword. The tricorder was aimed directly at the pod as if its contents were the most valuable cargo to ever board the ship. With everyone's attentions on the tail, everyone's attention on the tall, startlingly thin Vulcan doctor, Esri couldn't resist. It's a big, ugly worm, she whispered to Brenner, and you'll never catch me with one of them in my pocket. She jabbed her own elbow into Brenner's side for emphasis then squared her shoulders and smoothed her jacket. Someone else was coming up with a roundabout behind the door, and he wasn't wearing a Starfleet uniform. It designed look, its design looked Bajoran. They'd never pick you anyways, Brimmer whispered back, still keeping her eyes locked dead ahead. Triple niner. Esri snorted, but it didn't take offense, but didn't take offense at Brimmer's insult. She didn't care if she was among the 99.9% .9 of trail population unfit to be joined. She didn't even care if she was among the one-tenth of the percentage who were fit. She wanted no part of her parents' parasitic brain vampires and had never ever bothered to fill out the standard selection profile for the Symbius Commission. But before she could come up with a suitable, insulting rejoined for Brenner, Ezria felt her throat tense up as she recognized what was coming through the runabout door. A founder. Ezria looked from the eerie, half-formed, humanoid face of Changeling to the security guard by the pod and wondered why they didn't draw their weapons. There was a war on. The shape-lifting, the shape-shifting founders and their Jemadar had brought near ruin to the Federation. How could Captain Ramir permit this enemy to broad the vessel? Why wasn't Dr. Tepec offering any protest? Why weren't the changeling detection protocols being followed? How? Ezria's cascade of questions came to an end as she saw the founder place his hands almost affectionately on the surface of the transport pod. There. The symbiote remains in stable condition. Dr. Tepec said to the changeling. She even showed him her tricorder readings as if he were a colleague. The delay not compromised it at all. The changeling looked faintly annoyed, but Esri wasn't sure if it was an accurate reflection of his mood because his features were so alien and unreadable to her. As I said, Doctor, Jadzia had no difficulty using transporters. The Dax symbiont could have been beamed onto the ship and you could have been on your way an hour ago if you hadn't insisted on using the runabout. 
Esri glanced sideways at Brenner, trying to gauge his reaction to this surreal scene. Not only was the enemy on board, Destiny, he was actually criticizing Dr. Tepec, but Brenner's attention was still riveted on the transport pod and the symbiont within. Typical, Esri thought. She knew Brenner was desperate to be the 10th percenter, but given the waiting list at Symbiont's commission, she also knew that this was as close to a symbiont as he'd be likely to get in the next 20 years. Tepec maintained her patience with the changeling, but since the doctor was a Vulcan, Esri could expect no less. Constandable, I do not have to tell you what a valuable asset Dax is. Oh, Constable, I do not have to tell you what a valuable asset Dax is to Starfleet and to the Federation. As Jadzia Dax, it was on the front lines of war, and we cannot risk losing the knowledge or experiences. Some symbionts have unusual reactions to the beaming process, and with Dax already suffering from some type of energy shock and host death trauma syndrome, an hour's delay did not present an unacceptable, unacceptable risk in relation to what transportation reaction might have tri triggered. It was the logical thing to do. The changeling Shit, our ads running. Oh, wait a second. <laughs> it's not just so serious. Not for you? Okay. It said some weird disabled thing for me, and I don't know why. Um... Okay, good. I'll have to make sure I have a disabled button next time. Um, the changeling with unlikely ranked, with the unlikely rank of constable sighed deeply, then patted the transporter pod. Dax was more than an asset, doctor. It, she was a friend. I understand, Tepec said with equal parts respect and firmness, and we will have your friend on trill in two weeks. More than enough time for a recuperation and a new joining. The changeling nodded, then turned back to the runabout. Without once looking at around the shuttle bay, as if nothing on the ship was worth his attention, except for the worm. Esri didn't know, but it seemed obvious to her that at least she was, at least there was one changeling who was allied with the Federation for whatever reason. Immediately after the changeling had brought the runabout, Tepec had the security guards file off, carrying the transporter pod with anti-gravs, then with a curt nod indicating that Brenner and Ezra to follow. The doctor fell behind the pod. Her flashing tricorder held its operating position. Just before leaving the shuttle bay with others, Ezra looked at her shoulders to see the runabout slip through the bay's Can I say this? As astrophoric? Atomospheric force hold, force field in space. Astromic? Astromic? I know, like, I can't, I, I like, it's like on the tip of my tongue. Oh, whatever. Okay. Far beyond it, like a glittering ornament silhouetted against a frozen spray of fiery sparks, she saw Dia Space Nine. Each docking plion was matted with a ship, Federation, Bajoran, even two Klingon cruises. Other ships from other systems kept the station nearby, as if DS9 were the center of the whirlpool and the island of a calm storm-tossed sea. Too bad we didn't have a chance to visit, as we thought with real regret. With the war, there's no telling how soon the destiny might get this close to the front lines again. She resigned herself to the fact that she, like so many of sights, she had been in the brief time with Starfleet. This first glance of Deep Space Nine might also be her last. Then the shuttle bay personnel door slipped shut and she half stumbled as she hurried to catch up with Brunier and now marchingly, who's now marchingly dutifully in Chaprock's wake. That's a weird word. Dutifully. 
Um, even before Esri reached the others, she was wondering why the wide corridor was so quiet. By the time she fell into step with Brands, she had realized the answer. They were the only people in the wide passageway. Where is everyone? She whispered to her fellow ensign. But before Brand could answer, Tepec spoke. We are now in security condition alpha. The party halted before a turbo lift door as Tepec announced their arrival into their into her communication badge. Ezra and Brenner exchanged a silent questioning glaze, gaze glance. <laughs> Ezra knew that security conditions alpha meant that sections of the destiny had been sealed off from the rest of the ship by blast doors and security force fields. From training drills, she knew that alpha conditions were preventing lethal biological contamination or escorting being so crucial to the Federation that their loss would cause irreparable damage like the president of the Federation Council. As the turbo lift door slid open, Ezra murmured to Bremer, is that thing really that important? To Peck turned to, en to her ensign. The Dax symbiont has just served six years on one of the most important outposts involved in the war with the Dominion. As a Starfleet officer, it is known the last codes, the, la the latest codes, latest battle plans, the latest strategies. It knows our strengths. It knows our weaknesses. It knows the same about the key personnel in Starfleet Command and the Klingon Defense Force. How would you have us transport it back to your home world? On a pleasure cruiser? <laughs> Though the Vulcan's tone had not varied into the slightest, Ezra knew she had been severely reprimanded, and like Brenner, she unconsciously snapped to intention, eyes straight ahead, and Aaron Condet once again, no ma'am, she said, during Topeak's even voice trod Franklin Solon, the ship's surgeon, had stepped from the turbo lift to the chief medical officer's side. Now to Peck turned away from Esri to hand her tricorder to the surgeon. All life signs are stable for now, to Peck reported, but host death syndrome is known to cause rapid re reels without warning. Saloon studied the tricorder display with a frown. I understand. I've been familiarizing myself with the necessary emergency requirements. He looked up from the tricorder, checked out Brenner, then Esri, his large eyes reflecting the, down the tricorder's multicolored flashlight. Which one, he asked. We might not have a choice, Topek answered. Esri felt her spots pucker. What were the doctors talking about? You may proceed, Topek said to Solon. Keep a full implantation team to the standby and keep this subspace link to trill open. Salon nodded brus briskly, briskly and then stepped back into the turbo left with the security guard and transporter pod. See you in sick bay, sick bay said. Then the doors closed, leaving Ezri and Brenner alone with Tepec in the otherwise disturbed corridor. Here it comes, as we thought. She had a terrible feeling. She was about to find out why Dr. Tepec had requested the only two troll on board to meet her in the main shuttle bay. The Vulcan pulled a padded, pulled a pad from her medical smock, checked a text display on it, and she stared at Esri. Ensign Tegan, your medical writer records are incomplete. Esri, startled, first reaction was want to laugh. Four years of Starfleet Academy had left her feeling like a medical experiment. She had been scanned, genically decoded, re retro-pulsed, and biofiltered until she had decided her visits to Starfleet Medical would really convert training simulations, like some preserved psychological variations of the Kaboyashi Maro. If there were a cell in her body that Starfleet didn't have a blueprint for, then it had to be one she had grown in the last five days. I'm sorry, Dr. Ezra said, but I don't understand. With a long and delicate fingers, Tepec held over the pad so Ezra could read it. 
There's no symbious evaluation. Esri nodded in agreement. No, ma'am, there isn't. It is not law that all trill are to submit to pre -pre preliminary screening tests on their 20th birthdays. Esri's eyes widened. She knew Starfleet was thorough, but surely it wasn't going back to her 20th birthday to find flaws in her records. It's really not a law, ma'am, more like a custom. That's right, Dr. Burner said quickly, and Esri was glad for his support. First screening and clutch celebration similar to the human bar mitzvah or a Klingon blood kill. There's no actual legal requirement for anyone to take part. It's just everyone does. He glanced at Esri, almost everyone. Ah, Peck said. So the records are not incomplete. You simply chose to not undergo the screening. Yes, ma'am. Why? On one hand, Esri had was tired of that question. More than any other she had been asked. Secondly, only her mother's constant refrain of, why leave home to join Starfleet? The answer to that second question was that joining Starfleet was the perfect excuse to leave home. And with luck, to not go back for years, the answer to the question was far more complex. She and Brenner had spent hours talking about it over the past month, and Esri still wasn't aware of him, any, still wasn't anywhere close to having explained to all of her thoughts and feelings to him. So for now, she chose the easy way out. I don't wish to be joined, ma'am. Esri braced herself for the inevitable questions that follow. She expected that would be especially brutal coming from the logic-honed mind of a Vulcan. How can you make such a profound decision that will affect your entire life at such a young age? How can you not aspire to fulfill the biological destiny of your species? How can you disappoint your parents? On Esri's, oh, and Esri's favorite, what dark secrets are you hiding that you don't want the Simdian to know? But Tepec asked none of those. Instead, she called up another text display on the pad and then asked Brimmer, and Finnick, your medical records do include a primarily symbiose evaluation and follow-ups. Yes, ma'am. Logic suggests you do wish to be joined. Yes, ma'am. As we had tried not to think of any less than the younger man who had, to, who had so recently become her lover, what chance did we have? for true independence when the whole of Trill society was dedicated to brainwashing its children into believing there could be no higher goal than sacrificing their individuality to a plastic race of slug to a parasitic race of slugs. Very well, Tepec said. You are to report to Sick Bay until further notice. I will have Captain Ramir excuse you from another duty until you reach Trill. I I don't understand, ma'am, Grimmer looked nervously at Esri, then back to the door. Are you saying I'm to be joined with Dax? Esri stared at Brenner. The question was ridiculous. Even if a trill was biochemically suitable for the joining process, years of training and preparation were necessary before the procedure could be undertaken. But the Vulcan surprised her and Brenner Unlikely, Tepec said. However, in the event of the symbiont's condition worsens, we might stand ready to perform an emergency joining procedure. And since Ensign Tegan has not seen fit to have her suitably for joining an incest, you, it would be you, it would appear, are the only suitable trill on the ship. But, Brimmer stammered, I haven't been trained. Tepec raised an eyebrow. But Dax has. Eight times. Report to six sick bay at once. I love that. <laughs> but Brenner stammered, I haven't been trained. Oh, sorry. Uh, by now, Brenner's face was so pale, his spots seemed black. He looked at Ezria, but neither spoke. There were too much to say and no time to say it. Tepec stepped to the side and the turbo door opened. Brenner walked in. Like a contomed man entering a trinken brain wipe chamber, Esri thought. Then Tepec took her place in the life besides Brenner and gave Esri another curt nod. I have no further need of you, Ensign. Carry on. Yes, ma'am, Esri mumbled, and then watched Brenner until the lift doors closed and she heard the car sped away. 
Azria remained motionless in the side corridor after that, remembering once again how much she loathed the worms and starting, startling herself by how much she was going to miss Branner. I wish I was a Vulcan, Ezria finally said to herself. Life would be so much simpler without emotions. And with that defiant wish playing in the troubled mind, she returned to her quarters alone. By the third night onward bound from Deep Space Nine, Ezria worked up the courage enough to slip into sick, sick bay after duty hours. She had checked with the Sims ship's computer that Brainerd Fickner was not under quarantine. So technically, she reassured herself she wasn't doing anything wrong. She was simply visiting a friend, a friend who had not responded to any of the notes she had sent through the Destiny's internal messaging system. At ship's midnight, the main sick bay clinic was deserted. As Rhea could see, one of the medical department's biotechs, biotechnicians in his office, working on a dark pad. But other than the bright spill of light through the small cubicle's transport well, the main light levels were dim, and the only sound was the human of the, was the hum of the air circulars. Ezra walked away, walked quickly across the clinic to the closed door to isolate room two. The biohazard seal wasn't active, so again, she told herself she was not breaking any crucial protocols. Besides, besides it, the seal for the door to isolation room one was active. That room contained the apparatus for identifying changelings. Only Captain Ramir, Dr. Tepec, and the Destiny's chief of security had access to isolation room one. And then, only when two or three of them were present at the same time. Ezri herself had been randomly screened four times in the past month. She had heard that some command staff was checked every day. Such a vigilance was the price of war, she knew. And since the test was simple, just a quick prick and an extraction of a simple drop of blood, she had never felt in, indigent about it, indigent about it. But let the symbiosis, symbiosis commission ever try to examine a single follicle on her hair to assess her as a possible joining material. And she'd, this facility is off limits. Those are the first words Brimmer said to her as the isolation door slid open to reveal him standing by the lockdown transport pod containing the Dax symbiote. The young ensign's formal words and attitude were so unexpected that Ezra ignored them. She entered the small isolation room holding up the present she had brought, a fragile single crystal bottle of Samsit, just like the one they had shared on their fifth date, which was the first date on which they hadn't quite gotten around to leaving Ezra's quarters. Brenner, are you all right? I'm fine, he said, but you, you do have to leave. Brenner stepped in front of the pod, his back to the symbiont facing Ezra, as if it was about to challenge her in combat. Ezria knew what was wrong, tried to correct the situation. I'm not here to argue, she said. What you want to do with your life, and that's your decision. For the briefest moment, Ezria almost had the feeling that Brimmer didn't know what she was talking about, but then he seemed to relax. I'm sorry, he said, and I appreciate your trust, but you really do have to leave. I'm, I'm supposed to be under medical quarantine. Ezra moved closer to her friend, trying to coax out his playful side. She knew he wasn't under quarantine. He was just using it as an excuse. God, that means no one else will come in, disturb us. Ensign, please, Brainer said. He was actually pressing back against the pod as if trying to get away from her as possible. As far away from her as possible. Ensign, Ezra found me. My, aren't we formal? Ezria, Brenner said, as if correcting himself. Ah, that Ezri stopped two meters from Brenner. She felt her own face flush, even as Brenner seemed to maintain complete inquanimity. Ezria, we're back to that? As if last week didn't happen? After the first night they had spent together, close in each other's arms, Ezri had told Brenner how her younger brother had first called her Z where he was learning to speak, and Ezri had been too much of a challenge. Ever since then, it had reminded her 
brother's special name for her, and he had become the special name she shared only rarely and only with those like Brenner whom she had welcomed into her heart. So for Brenner now to call her Esri was a repudiation of what they had shared, of what she had believed they had come to mean to each other. I'm sorry, Brenner said defensively, and though he seemed to be upset by his cheeks and reminded pale, I don't know what else to say. Malias, Ezra said, so don't. She told him as she closed the distance between them. She brought her hands to Brenner's face, carefully holding the Samsit crystal bottle between her two fingers of one hand as she used the other one to crush his cheek. Then she la leaned in even closer and kissed him on, kissed him as he had just had that first night. Brenner, shra Brenner shrank back from her but only made her more determined. She held her more closely, kissed him more forcefully. Still, he had no response. Ezria went for broke, delicatary biting Brenner's lower lip, the way she knew he could not resist. Then, teasingly, she pulled, on, pulled back on it, forcing him to finally draw closer to her one way or another. But all he did was cringe, as if she did was unspeakable. Ezria didn't have to be betazoid to feel the revolution field him for one brief moment of emotional torment of which her mother would be proud of Ezri gave it in to the realization that she had somehow turned from Brenner's lover into a repulsive thing that he couldn't touch it was as if a phaser had been fired full power into her heart and then her self-respect came to the fo came to the fore this wasn't her problem. This was Brimmer's. He was the one who was behavingly res repulsively, repensively. He was the one who had changed. And the last word blazed in her mind like a giant, like a general quarters siren. Changed. Her eyes widened in horror. She be and because she was so young, so inexperienced, she said the one thing she should not say in the situation, the truth. You, she whispered in sock, you're not Brimmer. The hands of the man, the creature she caressed, struck her own hands away from his face. The fragile bottle of Sam sit shattered to the violence of his action, and as if watching a slow motion training simulation, Esri saw in perfect, horrific, horrific detail how the laser sharp shards of Sam sick crystal sliced into the thing thing's palm, spraying dark droplets of blood. Dark droplets that shimmered into golden spheres of the elemental changeling flesh before they reached the desk. At last, Esri screamed. At last, half falling, half running, she pushed back from the monster she had kissed, screaming even louder as the changeling's arms snarked after her, withering her the air like tentacles, sliding, slithering around her body like living water to tighten around the neck and cover her face in golden gelatinous mass that stepped up her nostrils into her mouth and down her throat strangling her from the outside choking her from the inside until her world turned black and all she saw was a spray of fiery sparks like that in that that had encompassed deep space nine in encompassed deep space nine In those final moments all she felt was horrible unending realization of how wasted her short life had been the heart-wrenching loss of it seemed to last forever seconds minutes millennia later a brilliant blinding light exploded in Ez Esri's vision drawing her forward as the voice of the creator of all things asked are you all right ensign answer me for a moment Esri was bemused by the fact that Starfleet rank had followed her into the afterlife. Then she opened her eyes and realized that the creator of all things bore in striking resemblance to Dr. Franklin's soul. Are you all right, Ensign? Esri sat up from the diagnostic bed, coughingly, forcingly. Do you know 
where you are? Another voice asked. Esri blinked to a bald human doctor standing at the other side of her bed. It took her a moment to recognize him as Destiny's emergency's medical hologram. The realization that an emergency exited was enough to clear her mind and completely sick bay, she said. Her throat hurt, but she went on USS Destiny. Captain Ramirez was besides Dr. Sloan, so she felt like this was most likely location of the facility. There were a changeling, she gasped. We know, Ramirez said. She ran a hand through his short gray hair. Her eyes were tinged with dark circles. Her pale cheek was smudged with a saw as if she had been in a firefight. A biotech heard your screams. We were able to get the security fields up in time. We got it. Ezra sighed with relief. It looked just like Brenner. Sloan nod. That's why we're concerned. That's why we concluded. That's what we concluded. But the security monitors were disabled through the sick bay, so we can't be sure. His dark eyes kept looking up through the diagnostic readouts behind Esri. She was suddenly aware she was wearing a flimsy blue medical gown. Am I all right? You better be, Sloan said. Esri didn't like the sound of that. Why? She looked again at the EMH and then around the other grim medical technicians surrounding her bed. Where's Dr. Tepec? That's how the changeling came abroad, Ramirez said. She held up her hands in gestures of helplessness. Ezria saw one of them bandaged, a few spots of blood showing. She was in charge of the changeling dictation. If not for you, Ezria noticed some of the texts were also wearing bandages. She could smell smoke in the air. Air. Has something happened? The changeling had a communication device when we co cornered it. The ship was attacked by Jem'Hadar. You've been out a couple hours. Ezri's mind was spinning. She felt as if she was given some kind of drug, but before she could ask anything more, she heard a life support alarm sound from the other room. A nurse ran to Dr. Sloan. We're losing it, doctor. Ramirez suddenly took Ezri's hand, and Ezri stared at her blankly. I've read your file, the captain said. Ezri launched. Ezri lurched as she was lifted on the bed's surface by two technicians with anti-gravity. Everyone walked at her side, following her towards the second room. Technicians shouted out medical orders. I know how you feel about symbionts. Ramirez continued her hand, still gripping Esri. Esri peered ahead through her enclosure, or her entourage. Saw two medical tables side by side opening the theater. One was empty, the other was not. No, she gasped not willing to believe what was about to ha happen. Where's Brimmer? Brimmer wanted this. It's his dream. We don't know, Sloan told her. The changeling possibly killed him, just like it killed the real Dr. Tepec. Brimmer, Ezri sobbed as the technicians locked her bed into place besides the table and held the symbiont. I'm sorry, Ensign, truly, Ramir said. But as of now, you are the only troll on destiny. You are the only one who can save Dax's life. I hope there's not ads right now. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ensign, truly. But as of now, you are the only troll on destiny. The only one who can save Dax's life. Please, Ezri whispered as the technician pressed on her shoulders. Thank you. Compelling her to lie down, she felt a drift as her gown was pulled aside to expose her ab abd abdominal pocket. The, the life support alarm beeped inconsistently. Ezria felt hot tears run down her cheeks. Ramir's hands, hand was rigged in her own. Everything was happening too fast. Ensign, listen to me, the captain said. She leaned over Esri, so there was nothing Ezri else in Esri's line of sight. I've spoken with the Symbios Commission. With the damage we've taken, there's no way you can get you to new facilities within 93 hours. You know what that means. 
Ezria did. The journey will be permanent. She felt her stomach contrast as something cool was being sprayed along the edge of her pouch. She wanted to vomit, but whatever medication she had been given presented anything from happening. That's right, Ramir said. So the commission is firm. No joining can be forced. Whatever happens next is your choice, do you understand? You have to make the decision. The Dax symbiont has less than 30 minutes to live. You have your whole life, but whatever you decide, you have to decide now, one way or another. Ezria turned her head, looked at all the people who surrounded her, staring, waiting, just as if her mother had watched her in a school play and on a sports day. The pressure, the waiting for failure, the need to be something different, the need to get away. What is your decision, Ensign? I'm a Starfleet officer, Ezra said faintly, almost unable to speak. You could order me. That could be an easy way out. Ramir squeezed Ezra's hands so tightly. Because you are a Starfleet officer, I shouldn't have to order you. Now, Ensign, what is your decision? Ezra closed her eyes. The thoughts, the fears, the memories that came to her at the moment, at that moment, would take her years to sort through, to order, to comprehend. But somewhere deep inside... One's inarguable fact from the past could not be denied. She was Trill. And one inescapable realization from her presence still burned in her consciousness, still burned in her consciousness with all the intensity of a dying thought. Until now, her life had been wasted. By all rights, Brenner should be here now. By all rights, the changeling should have killed her, not him. Somehow, she had been given a second chance. How could she let that chance be wasted, too? Ezra opened her eyes. Do it, she said, softly regretting those words, even as she knew she must say them. The eyes of her captain burned into hers. Are you sure, she asked. To, in to her internal amazement, for the first time in her life, Ezra Tegan was. Beneath the alien stars, in the cool of Las Vegas desert, Esri, with, Esri Dax withdrew her hand from beneath Vix Fonte's sports coat to wipe a single tear from her face. Man, oh man, Vic said. That was it? Not quite, Esri said. Took about 15 minutes to prep me. I'd never done any of the stretching exercises, things like that. All I remember was poor Dr. Sloan resliding everything he had about joining over the past few days. I think he was more upset when, than I was. Fifteen minutes, Vic said. Instead of years of training, and then what? They just plug the slug into the pocket and that's it? No, that's just, just the beginning, Ezra explained. She retreated into silence as she remembered those first tendrils of connection that was first tentative connect with the mind with all the minds of Dax slow it was gentle almost shy till the pathways were in place the nerve builds bundles fused until as if she were posed on the edge of a infernally tall cliff she had heard the first unforgettable trilling whisper of a thought not her own welcoming her to an extensive, inexpressionable, to a single mind. Just the beginning, Vic repeated. Ezra could feel him slowly shake his head. So, then what happened? Ezra settled into a more closely against Vic. She was reaching the point at which words could no longer express what had happened to her. That explosion of knowledge, of awareness of experience it was still overwhelming to her more than a year later what happened next she said was everything vic eight lives and 300 years of everything all at once and as she saw vic stared down wonderingly into her eyes esri at least understood that for now her story had come to an end it was time to tell her stories. 
dun 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 dun, and then it goes into other symbionts.